Hi everyone, it's Tom, WA2IVD. Welcome to video number two in the IC7100 from A to Z series. This time we'll look at initial radio setup, how to reset it to the factory defaults, and then we'll program a two meter repeater and save it to memory. In the first video, I mentioned that this radio has a lot of similarities to the IC7300 and that transitioning between the two radios should be pretty easy. Since I brought the radio inside, let's take a look at the connector similarities on each radio before we jump into the setup. Here's the 7300 and the 7100 side by side from the back side. Let's take a look at the common connectors between the two radios. The power connector, this is a standard ICOM power connector, so whatever you're using for a power cord, you can use it with both radios. The tuner connector is also identical between the two radios. So if you're using an ICOM tuner, or if you're using an aftermarket tuner made specifically for an ICOM, such as the LDG IT100 or the MFJ939, you can use that same tuner with both radios. Of course, you've got the SO239 for HF through 6 meters, the only one that's on the 7300, and that's the inside connector on the 7100. The accessory jack is an 11-pin, uh, excuse me, it's a 13-pin DIN connector, and the two of them are not exactly the same, but all of the functions that are common between the two radios are on the same pins. So you could make an accessory cable that, for example, uh, audio out or audio in, the squelch and push to talk functions, they are on the same pin. So you could use a common connector between the two rigs, depending on your setup and what functions you're using. The key jack is pinned the same, but it's a mini jack, one eighth inch mini jack on the 7100, and it's a quarter inch jack on the 7300. I think that's primarily because of panel space. The USB connector is a US is a type B full size on the 7300. It's a type B mini connector on the 7100. The remote jack is a 1 8 inch mini on both radios. That's for CIV remote control over a serial port. Of course, the ground terminal is the same on both of them. And that's pretty much where the similarities end. Now, let's take a look at the connectors that are different on the 7100. Of course, you have a second SO239 for 2 meters and 440. You have an RJ45 jack for the controller. That's what connects the base unit to the control head. You have a microphone jack, and there's a second microphone jack on the control head. These are identical but the manual warns you to use only one or the other, and they have them in both places so that depending on what your installation layout is like and where your wiring is run, it may be more convenient for you to connect your microphone to the base or possibly to the control head. Also, there's an additional accessory jack or a data jack on the 7100, and this is for packet data. This has 9600 baud audio that you can do on 440 so and it's got some of the same audio connections duplicated from the accessory jack and then you also have a, another key jack on the remote head it's identical to the key jack that's uh, where is the key jack there it is it's identical to the key jack that's on the base unit and then there is also a second speaker jack on the remote unit, although this one can be set up for a speaker or for headphones. On the bottom of the unit, there's a little switch, and you can set it to either a headphone or a speaker position. So that's all the connectors on the 7100 and the ones that are common between both rigs. Since I had to take the rig out of the truck anyway, as I was moving it around, I decided we might as well go through setting it up and take a look at what that involves. So as you see here, we've got the base unit and we've got the control head and we've got a cable. I have a little shorter one here and the microphone. This is the microphone that comes with the uh, 7100. 
I'm going to take this one out of here. And I've been using the uh, HM151. This is the remote control mic. So this allows you to change frequencies, change modes, bands, and a lot of other functions. It's kind of nice when you're mobile because you can do some things with your hand without having to reach over for the controls. So we're going to use that mic. So let's get things set up. First, we need to attach the cable here. Now, the rig comes with a cable, I think it's six feet, if I remember. I don't have it right handy. I got a shorter one, which I use when I'm using the rig as a base unit or as a portable unit, where I want the base fairly close to the head. I believe ICOM tells you that you should only use an ICOM cable or an ICOM-approved cable. This looks remarkably like an internet, uh, excuse me, an Ethernet jumper cable, and in fact it is, but if you do buy a standard, a non-ICOM cable for it, you want to make sure it's a straight-through cable, and you want to make sure that it's a shielded cable. You can usually tell that because the connectors, actually, instead of just being plastic, they will have this metal shield around them. And you can also look at the lettering on the cable. I don't know if I can get this where you can see it on the camera or not, but um, let's see here. I'll see if I can get a separate picture of this, but it says SSTP here, which is screened, shielded, twisted pair. A lot of Ethernet cable will say UTP, which is untwisted, excuse me, unshielded, twisted pair. And you really want to use shielded, twisted pair so you don't get RF uh, into the cable because that will mess up the control head. All right, so we're going to plug this into the control jack on the back of the unit. And the microphone connector and the control connector are, whoops, let me get that in the camera there. The mic connector and the control connector are identical, but the easy way you can tell, and of course they're labeled, but also the control connector, you can see the metal shielding on that. And the uh, microphone connector doesn't have that. So we've got the control head plugged in and we're going to plug in the microphone. So uh, we've got that plugged in. Try to dress my cable out of the way here. And then I have, this is a 2 meter 440 antenna that I'm going to hook up. We're going to do some stuff on VHF and UHF first. So I'm not going to connect an HF antenna right now. I always like to make sure that the uh, the connector is twisted so that you know the teeth are engaging so that you've got a good solid connection. And then finally, we're going to connect power. So if I've done this all correctly, you press the uh, volume control button for power. And there we go, and it's powering up. And I actually had it on two meters. Now, one more thing I'm going to do before we start going through all of the controls and menus. I've had this rig for several years now. It's hard to believe this actually came out in 2013, at least for sale. It was announced in 2012. This is April of 2020 as I'm recording this. The one thing that I'm going to do to make the menus a little bit more closely related to the manual is I'm going to set this back to all the factory defaults. So I'm going to unprogram all the memories and put everything back to defaults. So that should make it a little bit easier going through the manual with you. And to do that, we're going to press the set button here. And I've already got it on the others. There's four pages of menus that you have when you press the set button. We'll go through those. There's a lot of stuff. And you go down here to etc. others. And then the bottom choice on that page is Reset. So we're going to say Reset. And I'm going to do All Reset. And it comes up with a little message asking you if you're sure you really want to do this because this is going to erase everything. And then you press Next. And then it gives you another message telling you, hey, this clears all, the all of the memories. It disables the digital repeater mode. 
So again, it just wants to make sure you're going to clear everything out and make sure you really want to do that. So I'm going to say yes. And it just reset everything. And when the radio comes from the factory, 14100 is what it comes up on on the uh, uh, on the frequency. So it comes up on 20 meters by default. So the radio is now fully reset. All right, so we're connected up. We're plugged in. Let's uh, take a look at some basic operations. Okay, now we have our freshly reset radio to factory settings. And I'm going to... Actually, we'll turn the squelch up instead of the volume down. Now, I'm going to assume that at least some of you watching this may have bought a 7100 and you still have your technician class license and you bought this radio because you are thinking about upgrading to general or extra eventually and you'll be able to use this rig on HF, but right now you're going to probably start using it on 2 meters and 440. And if that's not the case, you still probably are going to use it on 2 meters and 440 at some point. So we're going to start out by putting in a 2 meter frequency and a repeater, and we'll put that into memory, which is something that you'd probably be doing in your car. So let's take a look at that. All right. This is the first radio that ICOM came out with that is a touch, touch screen operated radio. All the new SDRs that they have out today are touchscreen, but this was the first. And the touchscreen functionality is very similar to the new SDRs. If you have not used any of those before, it's fairly intuitive. So I'm on 20 meters right now, and I really want to go to 2 meters. So I'm going to just touch the megahertz part of the display, and it brings up a little screen here showing all the bands that I can go to. So 144 is 2 meters, so I'm going to touch that, and it comes up to 145 000 by default. And I'm going to program a local repeater in, which is 145.47. That's our local ECS or emergency services repeater in the area where I'm at. So let's just do it with the dial, and look at this. Um, I can't seem to do 145.47, and that's because the step size is 25 kilohertz. So as I turn it, the default step size is 25 kilohertz. Now, I could directly enter the frequency, and I can show you how to do that, but... We also probably want to change the step size because on 2 meters, I really want to be able to step in 5 kilohertz or at least 15, which kind of puts you on the normal frequencies. So how would I change the step size? Well, again, the touchscreen allows you to do that. If you press and hold this part of the frequency display, it brings up another screen that shows me my optional step sizes and you can go from 0.1 kilohertz all the way up to 100 kilohertz per step so for two meters and this is remembered by band so if i change it here it'll be different on 440 so i want my step size to be five kilohertz and now when i rotate the dial it goes in five kilohertz steps so now i can put 145.47 which is the repeater that I want to use. And you may have noticed on the lower part of the display, sometimes there's a frequency there and sometimes there is not. And the reason is that the repeater, excuse me, the radio has automatic repeater offsets, at least for the common frequencies. So in the lower part of the 145 portion of the band, it's a minus 600 hertz offset, so it's already putting the frequency in here for me. If I dial up, let's just go up to the 146 segment, and it doesn't do reverse offsets. I've used repeaters that are in the lower part of 146. They have kind of what's called a reverse offset, 
it doesn't recognize those, but if I go to the upper part of 146, as soon as I get to 61, which is the first standard repeater frequency, it starts to put the offset in automatically. And you can change the offset, but the default here is 600 kilohertz, which is correct for two meters. And if I go on up to the 147, the lower part again, so you'll see that coming and going when you're in VFO mode. So let's go back down and we'll get to the frequency we want. So I need 145.47, if I can get the dial to stay. And it's got the correct transmit frequency already in there, so that's good. And I have an antenna hooked up and we're ready to go, so let's just check something. WA2IVD testing. And you notice when I transmit, the transmit frequency shows up there. And I didn't bring up the repeater, and I know there that this repeater is very close to me. And the reason is I forgot I need a tone frequency for this repeater. So this particular repeater needs a 151.4 hertz um, tone in order to bring it up. So the touchscreen buttons on the bottom here, we'll go through these menus. You see it says M1 just above those, and I have the menu button here. As I press the menu button, it goes through the, the menus. There's three in this case. And as I can repeatedly um, press menu, it will go through the three menus and just keep cycling. So on menu two is tone. Now I can touch tone and you'll see tone showed up on the top of the display. If I touch it again, it goes to tone squelch mode. And if I touch it again, it goes to digital tone continuous squelch. And then it cycles back to no tone. So if I press tone, it will transmit a tone. Tone squelch, it won't open the squelch unless it hears a tone. How do I know what tone it is? Again, if you touch and hold the tone button, it will bring up a menu. And here it says tone squelch tone. And it's set to 88.5. That's the default. So I want to use, and I use the main dial to change it. I want to set that to 151.4. And this radio can remember the tone squelch tone and the repeater transmit tone as two separate tones. I'll be honest with you, I don't think I have ever seen a repeater that uses two separate tones, one for the tone squelch and a different one to bring up the repeater. But a lot of the more modern radios support that. So just like when you touch the tone button on the main menu, if I keep repeatedly pressing this, it cycles through the different tones that I can set. So here's the repeater tone. That's the one that the rig's going to transmit. And again, I'm going to turn that to 151.4 because I want it to be the same as the tone squelch tone. And then if I just hit menu, it'll go back out. So now I'm in tone squelch. I've got my tone set. Let's try this again. WA2IVD testing. And there we go. We brought up the repeater. Now, one more thing that you probably want to do if you're going to be using this repeater frequently, you're not going to want to dial all this in every time. So we're going to jump to the memory functions. So let me hit the menu button again. And then one more time. And on menu one, I've got scan, split, and then AB, which is VFO, A, and B. And you can see we're in VFO mode because it says VFO up here. V slash M, which is VFO or memory mode. And then MW, which is memory write. Now the memories on the 7100 are divided up into five banks. So you see A there. We're in bank A right now. That's the default. And there's a little blank next to it, which means that this particular memory has nothing in it. If you recall, we just reset it, so there's nothing in any of the memories. And we're on channel 1. Each bank has 99 memories. So there's a total of 495 regular memories. And then there's some call memories and scan memories. We'll talk about those another time. But so... And then if I keep going, it takes me through all of those. But 
I want to program this into memory one right now. Whoop. Let's turn him down. So this is the memory that I want to program. And all I have to do is press and hold memory right, and it will store the frequency, the offset, the tone squelch settings, everything that I've got set, It's in, and the mode, FM. So I'm going to press and hold that. Now to switch into memory mode, as I said, you can do the VM. So if I press this, now it says memo, and if I go through, of course it's blank because these other memories are blank. I haven't programmed them yet. And if I touch it again, it goes back to the VFO, and of course they're the same. So let's, just so we can tell a little more easily, we'll put the VFO back to 20 meters for the moment. And now if I go to memory, it goes to my memory frequency. You notice I just touched over here where it said VFO and the memory number. You can change here or you can change over here. The advantage of being able to do it on this part of the touch screen is if I'm in a different menu where the V slash M button is not available, this works all the time. So it's probably the most convenient to switch back and forth between memory and VFO up here. Now, one final thing we'll do this time around. I've got this programmed into the memory, and I've got the frequency in here, but it would be kind of nice if I could have something that reminded me that this is my local ECS repeater. So you can give the memories names up to 16 characters, and on menu 3, I was already there, but I'm going to go back through it here, Menu 3, there's a button here called Memo, which is the memory screen. And I can go in here and press List, and it now gives me a list of the memories. And, of course, my list is pretty empty because I've only got one thing programmed. These are those call memories and other ones that I was mentioning. So we're going to go to Memory 1, which has my frequency. You can see it there, duplex minus. And I'm going to touch and hold that item on the list. And now I have an option here to clear it, all clear, which clears everything, and edit name. And so I'm going to select edit name. And now I get a kind of a touchstone keypad uh, alphabet here. And I'm going to name this. And you notice by pressing the letter multiple times, it cycles through the options. ABC, and I'm going to call this the ECS, and I'm going to put a space. PQR, well, wait a second. Ah. I need to move it over. P, T, R. So we'll call this the ECS repeater, and then just press Enter. Now it shows the name there. And if I get back out of the list, now you'll see that when I go into memory mode, it says ECS repeater. So I think that's all we're going to cover for this time. So you've now entered a frequency, you've entered the tone squelch, you've got it in for the repeater memory, and you've stored it in the memory. Next time, we'll take a look at some more of the functions and some other things that you can do with memories. Sorry, folks. This ended up running a little bit long. In general, I'm going to try to keep these to no more than 15 minutes. So let's uh, hurry up and get out of here. If you like the video, I'd appreciate a like. If you like the channel, please consider subscribing, and I'm always happy to see your comments. As always, thanks for watching. I'm Tom, WA2IVD, and this is Ham Cured Smoke.